book of Acts and introductory matters of the book of Acts. And uh, I think we left off with uh, giving some names that has been around called the Acts of the Risen Christ or Acts of the Holy Spirit. But uh, finally, throughout wherever, settled on Acts. And it's really some of the Acts of some of the apostles. And namely, uh, Peter. And we might add John in there, but mainly Peter and, and uh, Paul. Uh, we're all aware of the person addressed. His name is Theophilus, which is a compound Greek word or name. From Theos and Feline, which means love or form of it. It means actually a lover of God. Um, he must have been quite well known maybe a friend of Luke, and maybe it even expressed uh, some sort of interest. It seems strange he would write Luke in Acts as detailed as they are, as long as they are, as, and someone not have an interest, especially when he wrote two volumes, Luke being one and Acts being the next. Uh, the term most excellent Theophilus gives us some idea of this person because that was a term that was commonly used for people in positions of authority in the Roman government. It's equivalent to our uh, modern uh, Your Honor or Your Excellency or something like that. You might compare Acts 23 verse 26 with Acts 26, verse 25, regarding most excellent, Acts 23, 26, compared with 26, 25. There are, and you'll run across some commentaries that say that this was no actual person, but that since it means lover of God, that it just stands for all lovers of God everywhere in all ages. I'm not one of those that believes that, and I, I don't because of just the way Luke and Acts begin. There's no reason to believe that he's just addressed to everybody that loves God. Uh, it doesn't sound like it. That is the flow of it, the approach of it. He is definitely writing to a person. Um, it's even thought that he may have been somebody that was uh, backing this particular work in publishing it. Now, the only way that they could publish anything was to hire scribes to write it down. And then uh, to get more than one copy, of course, it took a professional scribe to make those copies. And they were quite expensive. They cost a lot of money to do that kind of thing. Now, since uh, we know it was meant in providential providence of God to circulate uh, the thing that we know is that the kind of materials they had to write on, usually uh, papyrus or velum, velum lasts a little longer than papyrus, papyrus being a form of paper made out of the reeds that were beaten and beat together, but they would wear out with use. And uh, if the next thing that they used was um, stone, uh, that would be, of course, more like a monument, something like that. Uh, they also used, this is temporary type stuff, a wax tablet that tended to be used in a school or where they would be not expecting to keep it on the tablet that long. Interesting thing is that they used these in schools, these wax tablets, and they would take notes on them with a stylus. That's how they wrote on them. So when they filled the page up and they got out of it whatever they wanted to get out of it, maybe even transferring it to some other more permanent uh, source, they would then just take something hot, stick to it, and there would be no evidence of anything ever being written on it. So it was blotted out. And what is interesting about that is when uh, God says he'll blot out our sins, 
the same Greek word is used. And thus, you know, if you write something and rub it out like with a pencil, there's evidence that something has been there. But when you do that to wax, you can't tell, has there anything been there? And that's the idea of he blots out our sins. It's as if we have never had those sins. Interesting how those words are used. But those are some of the things that uh, they used. But it was all temporary unless it was uh, something like a... Uh, uh, well, like the stone, or also they used uh, uh, clay uh, to write on. That was the next most permanent thing to the stone. But that's it. And it took to make sure that things were recorded accurately, like some books like Luke and Acts or any other documents, then they had professional scribes. And um, sometimes you get a chance, just read the guidelines, the meticulous guidelines that a Jewish scribe had to follow when he's copying scripture. And it'll show you how meticulous it was and why you would have to pay a pretty good price. So it's been thought of that maybe Theophilus uh, funded some of this. Um, if I remember later on when we come to it, I'll mention something else about that. There is no... Un no uniform tradition from early Christians regarding the date of its writing. That is, it's come down to us. Um, we can do some reasoning and note that the earliest possible date is two years after Paul arrived in Rome as a prisoner, Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. And we just have to simply know some things that went on history helps us do that. I, this is one reason I urge you all to do at least some study uh, to familiarize yourself with just how much has come down to us and um, why we can verify some things in the Bible because of what's come down to us through secular means. Uh, it's likely that Paul reached Rome in the spring of 61 and uh, so Probably this could have been written around 63 at the earliest possible date. Uh, I, I think it was before 64 because um, Rome burned in 64 and uh, Nero blamed it on the small group of the Lord's church that was in Rome, small in comparison to about a million population at that time, which is a very big place for that day and age. And uh, also it's uh, probably, this is again a probably, that persecution in Rome led, caused by Nero blaming the fire that burned Rome on those Christians probably was when Paul was taken the second time and uh, he suffered martyrdom. But these, this knowledge of secular events uh, helps us get some idea of when this kind of thing took place. Uh, the date provides, this date provides about the best explanation for several facts that come out in Luke's writing. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever thought about it, but when you come to the end of Acts, there's just a sudden abrupt ending of the book. It just stops. And uh, why did that happen that way? Well, you can say that's the way God wanted it. Well, of course, but still he wrote out of his own study and the Holy Spirit guided him infallibly to select what he wrote, that it was accurate and guided him infallibly to write it. But he still had to use his own powers and his own ability and his own planning and so forth. Uh, whatever the situation, the book ends, well, just put it bluntly, abruptly. Uh, there's no mention also of Paul's first release from custody, no mention of his second imprisonment in Rome. And have you noticed that Luke never refers at one time to Paul's letters? And there's no mention of Paul's death. These are things that would be in a history if it covered that part of it. Uh, there's even no mention of the burning of Rome. That's one reason we realize it must have happened between 61 and 63. Um, because the Christians were blamed for that, and they were persecuted. I might mention about that there was no empire-wide persecution. That would come much later. 
and the book of Revelation is dealing with some of that. Uh, the attitude, the state of mind of the Roman officials toward Paul would have been really inexplicable if Nero's persecution of 64 had already begun at the time that Luke wrote this. And you couldn't tell if you didn't know anything about any persecution of, of Christians in Rome because of the fire. Uh, you'd never know there had been one if that's your only source. There's no mention of the fall of Jerusalem in uh, 70, and that surely would have made a difference, but there's no indication about that at all. Um, and surely uh, Luke would have mentioned some or all of these significant events in view of what he meticulously recorded about other things when they occurred or after their occurrence. And again, let me remind you, we, we must, realizing it's the Word of God, God inspired it, we must realize that uh, this has to be judged as a true book of antiquity like we would any other book of history that came down from that time and just how they wrote as to the place of writing, I think we have to say it's probably in Rome with Paul. Uh, he was waiting for his appeal to Caesar to take place, Acts 28, 30. And this brings up something now that I would like to go into to be a little bit lengthy, but it's the time chronology of the book of Acts. Luke covers about 30 three years of the history of the work of the church from the time of its establishment in 8030 to roughly, as I said, 63. And it's the only inspired history that we have because after it closes, we don't have anything like it in the New Testament. Uh, everything that Paul wrote in the New Testament, or Peter wrote, everything but the book of Revelation was written by the time of 65, roughly. So Luke's plan was to show the establishment of the church, the expansion of the church, beginning in Jerusalem and following the plan laid out in Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Chapter one, in verse 8. Now, I'll be giving you a number of chapters and verses, so you want to take notes. Uh, in chapter 1, 1 through chapter 8, 4, which would cover the years roughly 30 to 37, the work was going on in Jerusalem. Then Judea and Samaria, chapter 8, verse 5 through chapter 12, verse 25, and that covers roughly the years of 37 through 47. And then it begins to spread among the Gentiles, chapter 13, 1, through chapter 28, verse 31. And that uh, covers the years of about 47 through 63. And that's a general breakdown of the history. Now, there's particular things under each one of those headings. Um, you have the Ascension of Christ, chapter 1, 9 through 11, which would have been AD 30. Uh, you have, of course, the establishment of the church, Acts 2, 1 through 41, again, on first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in AD 30. The early work of the church, chapter 2, 45 through chapter 6, verse 7, again, AD 30. Um, the first, and here's where persecutions start, the first persecution against Peter and John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 31, that would have been again that same year, 30. There was another persecution recorded in Acts 5, verses 17 through 42, that would have been the next year, 31. And then you have in chapter 6, verse 8 through chapter 7, verse 60, 
the death of Stephen. And that's sometime around 35 and 36. And of course, there was a more general persecution following that, which we would say is the third persecution, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. That would have been again in verse L, or rather in the year 36. That's when everybody scattered from Jerusalem but the apostles, and they go everywhere preaching the word. And so Philip, as his preaching work in Samaria, chapter 8, verses 5 through 25, and that would be around 36. Uh, Saul is converted, the apostle Paul, chapter 9, verses 1 through 21, and that would be around 37. Then there's Paul's work in Damascus of Syria, then in Jerusalem and uh, Tarsus of Cilicia, chapter 9, verses 22 through 30. That would have been around 39, about nine years after the church was established. And mark this now, you've got the apostle to the Gentiles converted. We're going to come back and mention some things about the book of Acts along this line that many times is not noted as to the development of the church. Then you have Peter's conversion of Cornelius, the first uncircumcised Gentile, chapter 10, 1 through chapter 11, verse 18. That would have been about 41. And then you have the church among the Gentiles established in Antioch of Syria, chapter 11, verses 19 through 24. And that would have been about 41. Notice there's no church among the Gentiles established until you've got an apostle to the Gentiles converted. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. You have Saul then in Antioch, chapter 11, 25 through 26. That would have been around 43. Uh, James is martyred. Peter is jailed, chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. All this happening in the year 43. You have uh, the death of Herod Agrippa, chapter 12, 21 through uh, 23, and that would have been roughly 44. And here's where we can begin to look at Roman records and things like this and date some of this stuff even earlier, but uh, date some of this because we wouldn't maybe have, well, we couldn't date it very well or as close as we can without archaeology having discovered places and dates and so forth. Uh, you had the famine that came up on the land under the time that Claudius was emperor, chapter 11, verse 28, and that went through the years 44 to 48. Then you have the first preaching tour of the Apostle Paul, chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 14, verse 28, and that was in 45 to 47. Um, I said last week when you're reading through Acts, it's easy to move from one account of this to another account of something else, and you get the idea it was all happening one day after the other. Well, there was two years involved in that first preaching tour of Paul. So there's been, it takes a lot more time. But remember, the quickest way they had to travel was on the sea by a wind-powered boat or oars or on land by walking or riding in a wagon or a chariot or something like that, riding a donkey or a camel. So when you went somewhere, you had to do just like the rest of us today. You take in mind your mode of transportation and how you have to go as far as the roads and so forth in determining the time that you're going to go. Uh, in AD 49, you had the Jews kicked out of Rome by Claudius Caesar, and that's in chapter 18, verse 2. And then at this point, after the church has been in existence for almost 20 years, I keep that in mind, almost 20 years. You know, we're not saying absolutely and exactly, but almost 20 years. It was only at that point, after the uncircumcised Gentiles are converted, the church is established in Antioch of Syria, that then the Judaizing teachers rise up down in Jerusalem. You learn from Acts 15, 
that they came from Pharisees that had been converted, trying to make the Gentile converts second-rate citizens by saying, you've got to be circumcised, keep the law. Thus, they had the, this is the next chronology or point in chronology, um, the Jerusalem Conference, chapter 15, verses 1 through 29, and that was around 50. And remember, they had that conference not to determine what the truth of the matter was, but to find out where that doctrine came from. When you read Acts 15, take note of that. They're not trying to determine what's right and wrong. They're trying to determine where this uh, false teaching came from. Then on that um, first preaching trip, Barnabas and Paul go to Cyprus, and that's where they come across Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, and uh, chapter 13, verse 7, and that was in around 51 AD. And then we'll jump from there to the second preaching tour, the second preaching tour that Paul made, chapter 15, 36, to chapter 18, verse 22. And that's around 51 through 54. That's that many years. And then you have him in Corinth. This is another time we can date. You have the proconsul Gallio, chapter 18, verse 12. Um, and that was somewhere around 52 or 53 when Paul was in Corinth. And the reason we can date that time pretty close is because archaeology has excavated down and found Gallio's name on a monument of some sort there in Corinth and the date of it. I think I mentioned two or three times that the excavators, archaeologists, uh, stopped their excavations at the first century Corinth, as far as the way it's laid out in the ruins over there now, not that they haven't done other work, but that's where they found the judgment seat where Paul appeared. And uh, where Gallio dismissed them because he says, this is a matter about you Jews' religion, and I'm not going to hear it. Uh, which, by the way, when we get into this a little later on, is one of the things recorded that would work in defense of Paul. And I might as well just go ahead and say it. It's thought that uh, Luke was written as one of the reasons originally, and Acts was written as Paul was preparing for his defense in Rome. And not only that as its original reason for being written, but as we said last week or whenever it was, that uh, it was written with the idea it's going to comprise part of the New Testament of Christ and that it'd be around for people till the end of time, as is the rest of the Bible in the New Testament. Uh, so after Gallio, you had the proconsulship of Felix back in Judea, chapter 23, verse 24, through chapter 24, verse 27. And that would be in the years 52 and 53. Now, let me pause here and say this. No letter of the New Testament has been written at this time. If you can call the letter in Acts 15 one of the epistles, then yes, that was written to tell the Gentiles what they decided it was would be uh, concerning the Judaizing teachers. But as far as what we normally think of as the books that comprise the New Testament, none of them have been written at this time. So all of this is going on. Well, how did the church remain faithful? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, the apostles couldn't be everywhere all the time, and where the church was established here and yon, well, they laid hands on people and they had the miraculous gifts. And that's the reason it was so important that when you find the letter written dealing with the miraculous gifts, chapters 12, 13, and 14 in 1 Corinthians, to correct problems they had with it, that that letter needed to circulate through all the churches. If you had that problem in that church with the misuse and abuse of miraculous gifts, then it wasn't like that's the only place that could happen. These letters were written to be circulated among all the churches. And that's one of the first things we understand about how we know what letters are inspired and which ones weren't. The early church knew. And by tradition, they passed it on down as to what was a genuine article and what wasn't. But then you have the third preaching to of Paul, chapter 18, verse 23, through chapter 21, verse 19. And that was 54 through 58. Now, you'll notice several years involved in these last two in particular, 
trips and the things that, that happened. Um, so you have um, Galileo mentioned, and we know from Roman history when Felix and then Festus, that's where we are at this point, uh, were proconsuls. So you have the rule of Festus in Judea in chapter 24, verse 27, through chapter 26, verse 32. And that would have been from 57 through 60. Well, Paul's arrest took place in Jerusalem in about 58. And that's recorded in chapter 21, verse 20, through chapter 23, and verse uh, 32. Well, of course, you've got Paul's Mediterranean cruise that took place in getting him to Rome a cruise of which none of us would ever want to be on in the best of days. Chapter 27, verse 1, through chapter 28, verse 31. That would have been 60 and 61 in that area. I think while we can say that while chronology was not the primary interest of Luke, the physician, he did give very close attention to details regarding date or dates than most of the other New Testament writers. As far as Acts, we've already mentioned, it is the historical section. One book makes it up. And it, it really is a central link between the four accounts of the gospel and the letters of the New Testament. It uh, shows the very early beginning of, of the movement and uh, it shows what happened after Christ ascended. And you have the record already of his death, burial, resurrection, then his ascension. And uh, it gives a backdrop for the apostolic epistles and what an apostle is and the work of an apostle and where he's, how he's empowered uh, by God through the Holy Spirit. As we talked about the word parakletos last week, uh, no one word in English language can properly translate uh, what they received of the Holy Spirit in the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit uh, because it's a relationship as much as a giving of miraculous power, they had the same relationship with the Spirit invisibly as they did with Christ as he walked this earth. I will give you another comforter. It also gives us what's important is to the credentials for apostolic workers as they spread out throughout the Roman world like I say, we don't have a lot said about the apostles except Peter, John, mostly Paul. But whatever they were doing, let's just take Paul, for example. Whatever Paul was doing in his official capacity as an apostle of Christ, all the other apostles were doing. it. That's very important to understand. I don't know what all Matthew was doing. Um, I don't know what Andrew was doing. And so on you could go. But they were doing what Paul did as an apostle of Christ. So they had uh, their credentials. Now, what were the credentials? Well, Paul used that in defense of his own apostleship. When in, uh, what, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, when he says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Well, that sign belonged to the apostles and nobody else. It belonged to everybody. I wouldn't be a sign of an apostle. Moses had signs making it very clear that God selected him to do what Moses did. Everybody could do the work of the signs of Moses. There wouldn't be signs of Moses. So the apostles could prove. And it was such that in the book of Revelation, the letter to church at Ephesus, Jesus, through the Spirit, by the hand of John, the apostle, uh, approves of the church there putting those who claim to be apostles to the test and found that they weren't genuine. So that could be done by anybody. There's a historical background of Paul's letters in particular in the book of Acts. First and second Thessalonians, 
It's thought that they were the letters maybe first written. Um, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Romans, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, um, Philippians. You read through the book of Acts, you'll get introduced to the church in those places. Now they got started. I think especially the of the church at Ephesus. You probably have more in the New Testament about the church at Ephesus than you do in the other congregation. You not only have in Acts 19 the account of it beginning, then you have a letter to the church at Ephesus. And then you have one of the seven churches of Asia being Ephesus many years later, after Paul had been dead a long time. So Acts records also the work of the Holy Spirit in establishing, guiding, and perfecting the church, organizing the church. But remember, a number of years passed by before a New Testament letter was ever written. Well, how again did the church stay faithful through the apostles' doctrine and then the miraculous gifts that came through the laying on the apostles' hands? that gave these gifts to the members of the early church. So in this historical record, then we can see a pattern of church life. We can see the power that the church had. We can see its objective. We can see its methods. We can see its essential organization. We can see its discipline corrective discipline as well as preventive discipline. And we can see it taking the gospel to the world. And nothing mattered to those people if they were faithful but to serve the Lord. And you can see the dedication and zeal and faith of them by the very fact that preaching the word of God got them persecuted and driven out of Jerusalem. And what do they do? They continue to preach the very thing that got them ran out of Jerusalem in the first place. Now, in his account of the gospel, as we've studied, you'll notice, though, that he begins, it, he begins that record by saying, of all the things that Jesus both began to do and to teach. A lot of times we'll, we'll talk about teaching and doing. But notice Jesus taught what he did. Of all that Jesus both began to do and teach. Not only a lesson to us, but if we're living like the New Testament says, then we teach what we live. And that's a very important point, Acts 1, verse 1. So he, he notes, that is Luke does, what Christ continued to do through the agency of the Holy Spirit and his chosen apostles regarding the elect, the church, Christians. Acts is not a broad history. It's like the Bible. The Bible has one thing in mind. And that is uh, the forgiveness of the sins of men through Jesus Christ and now through the centuries, the unfolding of the scheme of redemption as to how that would take place. So it's a selective history. It's really a, a fragmentary record of the expansion of the early church over those years that we mentioned. And it deals primarily with the work of Peter and uh, Paul, because even as we have John, John is with Peter, what little bit they're mentioned. And then once Paul is converted, you don't have much said about Peter. Where we can find out something else about Peter is when you get to Galatians, and Paul has to tell about how he had to withstand Peter in the face when he had been there at the church of Antioch, the Gentile church, yet certain came from Jerusalem, and Peter played the hypocrite and wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Brethren, it's, I can't stress this enough, but the book is a, a very accurate record. And if you go and study some of the people, as I, I think I mentioned this talking about Luke, when we were in the book of Luke, uh, you'll see that much research is been done, meticulous research, to try to find where Luke was wrong, because he writes about so many specific things. He doesn't just write in generalities. And I mentioned Sir William Ramsey 
he wrote a number of books that are pointing out all of the details and how that none of them had been found wanting. He wrote the cities of St. Paul, St. Paul, the traveler and Roman citizen, the church in the empire or the Roman empire and others. And, uh, Luke um, has about 80 geographical references. One of the signs of a, of a witness being credible is when he refers to details. Because people who are not trying to tell the truth don't usually want to get in details because they get all confused. And that still tends, stands true today even in the court trial regarding whether a witness is credible or not. There were many official titles, such as procurator, consul, proconsul, praetor, polytarch, asiarch. Uh, when you get into the Greek, then those things are used and they meant a lot. Uh, I saw this thing interview on the street and they were asking these young people, who is our commander in chief? And most of them didn't know what in the world they were talking about. They had one that finally said, well, uh, when Luke starts writing these details and calling names and specifying geographic locations, that is indicative of the fact that he knew what he was talking about and it can be verified. So extensive research has demonstrated that all of these references are remarkably accurate. A fellow by the name of A.N. is English, Sherwin Dash White, Sherwin White, said this, and I quote, any attempt to reject its basic even in the matters of detail, must now appear absurd. Um, you know, there's not hardly any if of real learning people, people that really are scholars, even though they deny the existence of God or the deity of Christ, that will say that the books of the Bible, and since we're talking about the New Testament, the books of the New Testament, are not genuine books of antiquity because they bear all the marks that any other book that's come down to us from that time, a little later and earlier, uh, bear. So they don't try to attack the New Testament by saying, well, they really weren't true. They know that they were written by people believing what they believed at that time in history. There's more than 100 people that are mentioned by Luke in the book of Acts. And that's again, fits in with what I said earlier about going into details. Those things can be verified. At the, especially when you realize this Someone called it the acid test that was placed on the books of the New Testament because these letters circulated among the people and people lived for quite a while. And they could have said, this letter, this is not the way this happened. I was there. That could have happened regarding Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It could happen regarding all these things here. And Luke knows that, but nevertheless, he writes details. He's a good historian. It, uh, the book of Acts contains excerpts from 24 addresses, 24 addresses, which again, is getting pretty particular. And it's interesting that you've got nine of them by the apostle Peter and nine of them, the apostle Paul. There's another fellow who's a Greek, and I think I can get his name pronounced right, G.A. Hadjiantoniu, Hadjiantoniu, and he says this, and I'm quoting, we shall appreciate the historical value of the book even more if we compare the relative fullness of information we have in regard to the life of the church before the years A.D. 65 with our almost total ignorance of events of the period which followed to the time of Eusebius, the first church historian. Now we have uh, Eusebius's history of the church. I have a copy of it. 
Yet he didn't do this till around AD 313. Well, that's over 200 years past from the time Luke wrote. Luke wrote about things he witnessed, saw, or talked to people who were there. So that's how we come up with this. You remove the book of Acts from the New Testament, and look what a gap there is. It's also interesting to note that as you read through Luke, and you may not realize it unless you think about it, we've already mentioned it once, that Luke shows it starting right in the very heart of Judaism, Jerusalem, Judea. The first church was a Jewish church. Yet as it goes on, you see the Jewish element and uh, influence as far as a race of people on the church uh, waning, and thus there's the rise of the church or Christianity among the Gentiles. Of course, that especially happened when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 70. And they sold all manner of Jews into slavery, besides crucifying, no telling how many of them. Again, you can read Josephus, you're gonna read about that in particular. Luke's uh, writing, was really a two-volume set, the Gospel account of Luke and then the book of Acts. And so there is the inspired historical record of Christianity, one book dealing with the very founder of Christianity, and the other, the establishment of his church with that founder promised to build, Matthew 16, 18. He did, Acts 2, and then you've got the development all the way up through about 63, as far as what Luke wrote about in the book. Now, I can tell you some of what I am going to here simply for the record, but really to be able to know these things personally, you have to be studying a lot of Greek and a lot of other stuff for a long time, but still the people who are trained in the language, and I mentioned literary style, I think last week, maybe more than once, those who are that studious, that knowledgeable, note that the Greek text of Acts is considered among the best of the New Testament. You can count words, you know, because it's a dead language. No words are being subtracted from it. No words are being added to it. None of the words are changing in meaning. So he used some 732 words in his writing that are not found, that are not found anywhere else in the New Testament. Fellow by the name of E. M., his initials, E. M., Blacklock describes Luke's style as, and I quote, vivid, rapid in its movement, sure and purposeful in brief summary or leisurely report, amazingly evocative of atmosphere, economical of words, and I like the next part, but near drab in color because he's writing a historical document, he's not trying to write fiction. He's not trying to tell you the color of the sunset as it sets to the west over the Mediterranean as you stand at Caesarea and gaze toward the west. He didn't do all that. What does that have to do with anything that, that, uh, as far as uh, the way you write factually? He quotes that, or that quote came from a book called Acts of Apostles, uh, pages 12 and 13. When you try this sometime, start reading the beginning of Paul's preaching tours and read all three of them, even into the boat trip, what happened on it, getting to Rome. And it almost sounds like a travel log in the way that he records what transpired on those particular uh, journeys. Uh, I have had several advertisements from tour groups 
telling you about on this day, you did this, you'll do this. And on the second day, you'll do that. And you'll journey here on the third day. And I've been on one of those. And uh, when I thought about that, that's right. It does. It sounds like a travel log as he covers those things that are pertinent to why he wrote the book of Acts in the first place. Um, again, the Greek text of Acts. Now here again, the only way you're going to get into some of what I'm about to say is if you're studying what are the best Greek texts of the ancient texts, because you have two traditions. The one that's called the Western text and the Alexandrian text. And we're not going to get into all of that. We could, but this is not the time and place for it. The Western text has about 10%, that is Luke's writing in Acts, is about 10% longer than the Alexandrian. But there are no significant changes or additions in content. One fellow observed, a man by the name of Frederick Blass, and, and this is just his observation. I'm not saying he's right, but it's interesting. He suggests that the Western text was a rough draft, and the Alexandrian represents Luke's final revision. Well, you say, I thought he's inspired, and the Holy Spirit's guiding him to write this. Well, it is, but remember, he did research on his own. He had to put the thing all together. Now, the Holy Spirit guided him and thought we'd do it. But that also means he may have worked on that. And the Holy Spirit guided him in those things. Be that as it may, there are marks of the kind I'm talking about that tell us much about why we think of the book of Acts as we do. And that would be in the case of many other uh, particular uh, books of the Bible. Well, Let's see, it's about time for us to quit here. Um, a lot more I want to say on this, not on this particular language and literary style or Greek text, but just on things that you'll find, I think, quite interesting as we emphasize them in the book of Acts. But for tonight, we'll call it quits here. And do you have any questions at all?